The Lord be with you. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. It's lovely to see you here this morning on the 19th Sunday after Trinity for our service of Holy Communion. Uh, And lovely to see and hear of so many children in our midst this morning as we hear those words from today's gospel. Just a a few short announcements. One is that next weekend, if you haven't heard, we're in for a very uh, nice, lovely, exciting weekend in Rathmichael. On Saturday evening coming, we have our Harvest Harmonies concert uh, here at, oh now I've forgotten the time, 7 p.m. in the church. Tickets are available from the church wardens after the Uh, service this morning. They're available on Eventbrite or indeed if you come along next Saturday evening uh, there will be space hopefully and you'd be more than welcome. It promises to be a great evening. Then next Sunday morning we have our Harvest Festival service at 11am. It's one of the highlights in the annual calendar in Rathmichael. Uh, I know Margaret Nevin and all of the, uh, the flower people are busily and excitedly preparing. On Saturday morning they'll be here decorating. Uh, and, but after the service next week, we're going to have our also annual um, harvest sale in aid of Christian Aid Ireland. So if you could make something, bake something, bring something along with you before service, that will be greatly uh, received, uh, gratefully received, uh, and all of that will be available uh, for purchase uh, along with donations at coffee after our service next week. The preacher is a friend of mine, Reverend Dr. Andrew Campbell who has been recently instituted as the rector of Mahara Felt in County Armagh, but will also is the lecturer in Anglicanism in the Church of Ireland Theological Institute. And we look forward to welcoming him and gathering together uh, with a wonderful celebration of harvest next week. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number seven, My God, how wonderful thou art, thy majesty how bright. Now there's a quiz for us. How many people knew the words of that hymn off by heart? Well, I certainly wouldn't have, but I had, I had the correct words in front of me. Our apologies for that. I'm guessing uh, uh, there was some confusion over a hymn number between 281 and number 7 earlier in the week. We were on hymn number two, 7, 
but the words of 281 were still on screen. That, that is my fault. Uh, we join together as we come to our time of worship in, by praying the colic for purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us, and write these your laws in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may walk in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect of the 19th Sunday after Trinity. O oh God, without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as it comes for our Sunday Club children to leave, uh, before we say a short prayer for them, a reminder also if you're visiting us today that there is a parent and toddler room also in the same direction uh, with toys available. Uh, children, we hope you have a lovely time in Sunday Club today. Enjoy your lesson, uh, and before you go, we pray. Lord, we thank you for the children, the young families, and the teachers and leaders of our Sunday Club. We ask you to be with them today and all days. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We'll see you after the service. And for the fifth week running, it's, it's wonderful to be able to say, after the mass exodus and the few of us that are left in church, uh, we continue in our worship by singing together the psalm appointed for this morning, Psalm 26.
I invite you to be seated as we listen to the first reading from the book of Job. The first reading is from the book of Job, chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. Introduction. The book of Job is about suffering. It seeks to answer the question, why does God allow the faithful to suffer? The first two chapters, which are in prose, tell of a very righteous man named Job. In this reading, Job's integrity is tested. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, Skin for skin. All the people have their will give give to save their lives, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well. He is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job. And from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat amongst the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of the Lord and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Paul. We join together in singing the gradual hymn number 649, Happy are they, they that love God, whose hearts have Christ confessed.
Hear the gospel of our Saviour Christ according to Mark chapter 10, beginning at the second verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. May the words I speak and the words you hear this day be in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now you're all sitting wondering what I'm going to go and preach on. (laughs) There is going to be some humor today, that's the good news. But it's not going to be around Jesus uh, talking about divorce. I've spoken to several clergy in different uh, ways uh, what instances this week and for different reasons and every one of them were dreading uh, this Sunday in the lectionary and I actually have to admit I hadn't looked ahead to this Sunday and noticed what the gospel reading is we have two readings in this church um, and but I hadn't really paid heed to what the gospel was because as those of you who have been in recent weeks know throughout July and August we looked through the letter to the Ephesians Uh, Then in September, we looked at the letter of James, and I thought it might be time for us to spend a few weeks where the lectionary allows us to in the Old Testament. And so for weeks at this stage, I've been planning to bring us into the book of Job over the weeks of October. It's a long book, but we'll touch into it in little bits. And for that reason, I hadn't noticed until it came to prepping the service for this week what the gospel reading is and was, Uh, but I'm not going near the gospel today. What I want, and not for the reason that I'm trying to avoid it, in some ways as I sat there listening to the Old Testament and then once again reading that gospel reading, I thought, "Mm, did I still draw the short straw of the two readings this morning? Job is not an easy book to get into. It's not not pleasant. It's quite terrifying in ways, not least the introduction that we've received this uh, this morning from chapter one and chapter two is the prologue. And the next 30 chapters are ultimately conversations that go on between Job and his three friends. And that word friend is very much used in an ironic sense. I would encourage you over the next week, take out the Bible, read the book of Job. Uh, It's accessible, it's easy to read. Ultimately, we think, yes, Job is about suffering, but part of the reason Job has worked out in the lectionary this month, of course, we have harvest next week, one of the big overarching themes in Job is actually God's wonderful sovereignty over all of his creation. And so we will be looking at the lectionary reading on Job next week, or rather our guest preacher will. Uh, Suffering is one part of Job, but actually behind that there is the wonder and awe of how big and great God is. But in that prologue this morning, we get that unsettling vision of the heavenly beings coming before the Lord. And amongst the heavenly beings, we have Satan. Now, we touched briefly last week into a part of the book of Revelation, and we heard about this being Satan. And here we hear him today coming into the presence of God. So he's got ready access into the presence of God, and God asks him, where have you been? He says he's been walking to and fro and up and down over the earth. 
And then we get this, there's a lot of kind of irony and almost sarcasm and dark humor in the book of Job. And ultimately what we've heard this morning, which Paul read, is this almost like this sick bet that God puts on with Satan. That Satan has been looking over and back up and down the world and they talk about this righteous, blameless, beautiful, pure man, Job, who spends his life praising the Lord. He has been blessed, he's wealthy, life is going great. And they decide, well, let's put him to the test. Satan reckons if God, if you start bringing your wrath upon Job, put him to the test, he'll turn around and he'll curse you. And God, knowing his created order better, gives Satan, which is quite unsettling for me and I'm guessing you, gives him permission to go off and start tormenting Job. And the only limit that he has given to the torment that the devil can put onto Job is that only spare his life. So do whatever you will to him, but don't kill him. And in all of this, by the time we get to the end in the epilogue at the end of the book, we see that Job, amidst losing everything, remains faithful. And there is a quite a long but fruitful lesson for every one of us in the sufferings that we endure in daily life and in life in general. The book of Job is about suffering, and as the introduction to the reading that Paul read said, it's primarily about the question, how should we respond to suffering? But Job is also a misunderstood book that isn't ultimately about displaying how holy Job is, but about how good God is. In the letter to James, chapter 5, which we didn't actually get to because last week's feast day of Michael and all angels intervened, James writes this, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. If you take out the book of Job this week and read it, you realize that by the end of the book, a wonderful thing happens. And James uses the example of Job's as an example for all Christians to follow in perseverance. Yet, throughout the book, and particularly in the introduction today, things don't seem very good. Even today in our modern society, people accuse God of being a monster for what he put Job through. So let's just consider briefly, as we will hear in the coming weeks, but we are only dipping in to key parts of Job. We're going to consider now what God allowed. So first of all, Job's donkeys are stolen and his servants are massacred. Then lightning strikes all his sheep and shepherds. Raiders come and steal his, his camels and kill yet more of his servants. And then a house where his children were holding a party collapsed on all of his children, wiping them out. Job got all of the, those four different pieces of news from servants in the span of about two minutes. And then later more is added into the mix. We pick up in our reading this morning Chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Sores break out everywhere in his body, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. His wife leaves him, though many scholars would argue that in the midst of all of his suffering, that might be one of the small comforts Job actually receives. <laughs> Read the book and you'll know why. And then, of course, Job's friends cap it all off, his three friends, by basically saying to him, what did you do to make God so mad? Job's friends pay, play a key part in the book. They have wonderful names. If there are any of you here this morning currently expecting a baby, here are some ideas for when the baby is born. We have Elihu the Temanite, Zophar the Namathite, and my personal favorite, Bildad the Shuite. <laughs> wonderful names. So Job's friends, or in the old King James version, as they're called, Job's comforters come along. And again, that's used in a sarcastic, ironic sense. Because all they do is poke fun at Job. They mock him. They tell him that it's obviously his own fault that he's experiencing all of this suffering and misery. And yet, the thing for us in daily life is, we all have those people in our lives who come along in a time of difficulty and where ultimately all we need is a friend or a family member to sit with us, hold us, hold our hands, maybe even say nothing. We all know those people who come along with their unsolicited advice, don't we? You could feel yourself on the edge of your seat waiting for the punchline in all of this because it's horrific stuff. 
Yet through it all, God knew that Job wouldn't curse him because he trusted God more than his current horrible circumstances. After some awful, awful theology from Job's friends that I've briefly mentioned, you know, basically saying, this is your own fault, you must deserve this, they're really, really awful friends, and they go on to long, long diatribes in some cases that last three chapters. Job's own insistence at God being in unjust crops in, and then God appears in a whirlwind, not like a little burning bush, as we heard in the family service two weeks ago, or not a quiet voice from a cave, or that still small voice of calm that we sometimes sing about in one of our favorite hymns. God play comes in a whirlwind. He's not playing games, and I'm pretty sure that all of these, Job and his three friends, know it. But first in all of that, God has a few words for Job and his pals. In Job 38, he says, who is this who darkens counsel with words without knowledge? In other words, to Job's three friends, who are these Egypts? Who are these bozos? That's all God needs to say about Job's friends. Then God tells Job that God wants Job to ask some questions because God can clearly learn a thing or two from Job. It's Scholars would argue the only place in the Bible where we see God joking in a very sarcastic, ironic undertone. God is essentially telling Job, all right, big shot, so you want to throw around accusations like you know something? Well, let's chat so you can tell me what's what. God says to Job, where were you when I laid out the earth's foundations? Job finally does get to the stage where he cries out to God, why have you done this to me? Why have you allowed this to happen? He doesn't curse God. He stops short at that. But he gets to that place that we've all been in. And I know there are people here today that in recent times have been in this situation. Why and how long, Lord, is this going to go on? Why is it happening? Why are you allowing it to happen? I can't make any sense of it. And ultimately, Job knows that he has messed up at that stage where he starts questioning God. His life was arguably more shaken than ours will ever be. Yet, even in that, he realized that he had no right to doubt God, that he was called to be faithful. The really lovely thing about these chapters is how God deals with Job, and indeed, I dare say, deals with us. God never explains what happens to Job. And Job doesn't even seem interested in the why of it all. God simply shows one thing both to Job and to us, that God isn't merely a more advanced version of us. He is something completely other than us. And our infant minds simply have no room to question the one who created the universe and rules over it with absolute power. God is God, we are not, and remembering that is essential. But perhaps also we see a hint of that suffering when the angels assemble before God and Satan comes with them roaming across the earth. It's clear that his objective is to cause as much suffering as he can. It appears uh, that he was a fallen angel. It seems that before God created human beings, he created other free, imaginative, and intelligent beings, and that there was a rebellion within the spiritual realm before human beings even emerged. And that was the war, the feast day, that we celebrated and commemorated last Sunday. A great deal of suffering can be explained as being a result of the fact that we live in a fallen world, a world where all creation has been affected, not only by the sin of human beings, but also, before that, by Satan's sin. The serpent existed before Adam and Eve sinned. As a result of Adam and Eve's sin, thorns and thistles entered the world where previously God's creation had been perfect. Ever since that time, in the words of Romans 8, the creation was subjected to frustration. So for example, natural disasters are a result of this disorder that is ongoing in creation. When we face unexplained suffering, it can be very easy, like Job, to blame God and question him. And although Job did not know why he was suffering, he responded by continuing to trust and worship God in his pain just as he had in his good fortune. 
The writer of Job tells us admiringly at the end of our reading today, chapter 2, verse 10, in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. He remained faithful even in the most difficult of circumstances. Initially, Job's friends respond in the right way. They didn't say a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. And then they went on to do what they do. In the face of great suffering, attempts to rationalize for any one of us can be counterproductive. I regularly sit and have done this past week with families in difficult situations. In this past week, it was in the context of a parishioner whose funeral will take place on Wednesday in our and it was in Our Lady's Hospice. I had seen him a week previously. He had obviously failed miserably in the intervening time. And there was so much that I wanted to say and thought I would say and could say to his families, his family members, and yet all that sufficed was to sit there, shut my mouth, say nothing, and be present. But those attempts to rationalize for any one of us can be counterproductive. Usually the most positive thing any of us can do is to put an arm around the person and, in the words of Romans 12, mourn with those who mourn entering their suffering and partaking and participating as far as you are able. In the end of this book, as we'll see in a few weeks' time, God restored Job's fortunes and gave him more than twice as much as he had had before in the beginning, where we're told he was one of the greatest people in the land that he lived. And now, we today know that through Jesus, God has all eternity to more than compensate for all our sufferings in this life. We're merely called to keep following, ask him to carry us when we're no longer able to walk with the promise that is ours through the death and resurrection of Jesus that one day we will live in the restored created order when there is a new heaven and a new earth and all white cr crying and pain and suffering are wiped away and we are made perfect and see the image of God face to face. Amen. And so I invite you to stand as we affirm our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, who for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For the increase of our faith and the spirit of service, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we pray this morning that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would keep the church faithful to the teaching entrusted to her. Make your people obedient servants, seeking no reward but to do your will. Lord, we pray for the strength of your Holy Spirit to pour out abundantly into us, especially in those times of suffering, difficulty, and doubt. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would grant to those in authority care and consideration for those who serve. Stir up in all people the knowledge of your gifts that all may seek the good of others. We pray, Lord, that you would empower each one of us to know how to respond to the needs of others, to sometimes just be present silently 
And when the time comes to speak, that you will give us the words to say, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would bless our families and friends with stronger faith. Empower us to make known to our neighbours and those with whom we work the assurance which we have received. We pray, Lord, that our lives will be a visible example to all those around us of faith in you, particularly, Lord, with how we deal with the difficult moments of life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would have mercy on all those whose work is heavy and brings little reward, and indeed all those who suffer stress and anxiety for the care that they have for their roles. Strengthen those who labour for the spread of the gospel in difficulty and persecution. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of peace, we ask your presence today in the Holy Land and the lands of the Middle East and in all places in the world where warfare is waging. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit and your peace, which transcends all understanding, would go into the hearts and the minds of all those who wage war and who are bloodthirsty for the genocide of other generations. We pray that you would bring your still small voice of calm or indeed speak to a whirlwind that people would know to put down weapons and to seek peace, forgiveness and reconciliation above warfare, strife and division. Lord, in your mercy. In the moment of silence in our hearts, we bring to you, Lord, all that weighs down our spirits this day. As those who desire to be good servants of Christ, we offer our prayers in his name as we say together, Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We join together in singing the offertory hymn number 501, Christ is the world's true light, its captain of salvation.
Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen high priest. Make yourself known in the breaking of bread. Amen. Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed for us. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For the almighty and ever-living God, at all times and in all places, it is right to give you thanks and praise. And so with all your people, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Father, the creator and sustainer of all things. You made us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. Even when we turned away from you, you never ceased to care for us. But in your love and mercy, you freed us from the slavery of sin, giving your only begotten Son to become man and suffer death on the cross to redeem us. He made there the one complete and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we do as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, Grant by the power of the life-giving Spirit that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your Son, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
holy and blessed God, you feed us with the body and blood of your Son and fill us with your Holy Spirit. May we honor you not only with our live lips, but in lives dedicated to the service of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just before we pray the blessing, there's one announcement that I forgot, and that is that on Wednesday coming, the 9th of October, we're going to have the first in our new monthly prayer meetings. Uh, it'll be taking place at 8 o'clock in the committee room just down towards the Irk Hall. It's going to be 45 minutes where I've said in the email to uh, come and get away from the busyness of life of uh, a peace and quiet. There'll be a short reading and reflection and then some time to pray for the needs of all those in our church community and for everything else uh, that is going on in the wider world. Uh, it's a nice way to come, spend 45 minutes to just escape the busyness of the midweek and all are most welcome and do spread the word. Let us pray. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you this day and remain with you always. join together in singing our closing hymn this morning, number 259, Christ triumphant, ever reigning, Saviour, Master, King.